Let's talk about exploratory data analysis. Given a data set, what tools are there to explore the data set and what can we learn? Like how much data is there, what type of data, any missing values, any outliers, etc. So exploratory data analysis, also known as EDA, it's an approach to analyze a data set and capture main characteristics of it. Collect and aggregate the data, perform initial investigations to discover patterns, spot anomalies, test hypotheses, and check assumptions. Using summary statistics or graphical visualization representations like histograms and plots. You can also pre-process your data to produce more meaningful information from the raw data given. So let's see how can that be done with descriptive statistics. Uh, overall statistics, you can figure out how many instances are there, like how many data samples you have, which is the number of rows. You can look at the number of columns of your data, tabular data, and figure out how many features you have to build your model upon. And you can then look at individual single features, and uh, if they are numerical, you can uh, figure out maybe the mean, the variance, the standard deviation, uh, the, you can build some histograms. You, uh, for categorical feature, we can examine their unique values and also uh, look at some histogram of those values. And in particular, for the target variable or for the target uh, you know, column of your data set, you can uh, figure out uh, if you have an imbalanced or balanced data set by uh, looking at the class distribution, uh, right? It's kind of like a histogram of the classes in the target variable. You can also take a look at more features than once, right? You can uh, figure out correlations or any relationship between uh, one or two more features, and that's called multivariate statistics. So let's start looking at one feature at a time with these histograms. Using Panda commands to generate histograms and matplotlib to plotting them, histograms are a good way to visualize and explore one single feature at a time, being numerical or categorical. And they group the data in bins, and provide us a count of a number of observation in each bin created for visualization. They're also a fast way to get an idea about the distribution of each feature in your data set, because from the shape of the histogram, you can easily observe the distribution being either Gaussian or normal or central, skewed to the left or to the right, or maybe exponential, like the possible one we have here in the first plot. Uh, you can also uh, look, use histograms to figure out or just try to see if you have any possible outliers in your data set. They're usually sitting way far, farther away from the, um, where the most data, data samples live. Or it can help us identify imbalanced data sets. Like uh, if the second graph here would be the graph of our target classes, uh, there will uh, you know, be a red flag on our data set being highly imbalanced. Uh, the matplot module uh, it has also a method for drawing scatter plots, so you can actually compare how two features relate to each other. The, the scatter plot in matplotlib module needs two arrays of the same length, uh, one for the values on the x-axis and one for the values on the y-axis. And these uh, scatter plots can be informal, informative on how strongly some pairs of features are basically related. So you can extract some information about core relations, if they are related or not. The scatter plot matrices visualize, you can visualize feature to feature or feature to target uh, pairwise relationships. And sometimes the feature to target a uh, scatter plot might be also interesting to figure out how some of the uh, features uh, Im impact your targets. So the first scatter plot here shows no correlations between the features considered. While the second scatter plot, we have two features that are highly correlated. In fact, they are positively correlated. And that is when one feature increases, the other one increases as well. We can also have negatively correlated features. And that will be when one feature increases, the other one decreases. Not shown here, though. If looking at graphs is not your game, uh, right? If analyzing plots is harder and visually uh, hard to assess correlations, there, is so -called co there are so-called correlation matrices that measure the linear dependence between features. They are easier to read. They can uh, be even easier to uh, read with some heat maps to distinguish between stronger and weaker correlations. Uh, the correlation values are typically between minus 1 and 1, with minus 1 meaning perfect negative correlation, 
and plus one meaning perfectly positive correlation, while zero means no correlation whatsoever between the two variables um, examined. So these are the correlation matrices associated to the previous scatter plots that we had. So our understanding or evaluation of correlation was, uh, was correct. The first one, we noticed uh, the features one and feature two, they really don't have much correlations going on. Their numbers are very close to zero. Whereas for feature two and feature, feature one and feature two in the second example, uh, they seem highly positively correlated with a correlation coefficient of 0 0.8, 0 0.9 almost. Now, correlated features will not always worsen our model, but will not, uh, will not always improve it either. So, using the correlation matrices or the scatter plots to identify correlation between your features could be beneficial to your model. Ideally, you would like to identify and remove correlated features, keeping one of them only. For one, dropping features will improve or speed uh, reduce dimensionality of your model. On top of that, simple models built on less feature, that is, are most of the time preferable, easier to interpret and uh, easier to implement. And if the features are correlated, the ones that you drop will probably not be super informative in the first place, so the algorithm might not suffer that much by dropping them. Also, highly correlated features make it impossible um, or hard to find unique solutions for linear regression models, for example. Without going into a lot of technical detail here, uh, let's consider a house price example predicting the sale price of a house based on score footage and another model maybe predicting the square price, uh, square sales price of a house based on the number of bedrooms. So the intuition would be that the more square footage, the more the price of the house, so it will increase the price of the house. And in both scenarios, maybe the uh, number of bedrooms, increasing the number of bedrooms, will also increase the number of uh, the sale price of the house. Now, keep that thought. If we build two separate models, right, on the bedrooms and the sale price, uh, that might be the case. However, the house size and the uh, number of rooms are also highly correlated features. If you think a bigger of a house, maybe more bedrooms you have. But if we want to build a model on including both of these features, the size of the house and the number of bedrooms to predict the sales price of the house, it might happen by the nature of the linear regression that say for the same square footage, the influence of the number of bedrooms might on the price might take a turn. Because given a house with a particular um, square footage, the same size, increasing the bedrooms might actually be less valuable. So the you know, smaller bedrooms. So the price of the house might actually go down. And so the linear regression model, it becomes less stable when the correlation between two of these features in this case is very strong. On the other hand, a highly target to, I mean, highly, high, highly correlated features to target could be beneficial to your regression models, right? Because you figure out, um, uh, features that will really uh, contribute to the actual final uh, target of your either classification or regression model. Class imbalance is a surprisingly common problem in machine learning, specifically in classification, occurring in data sets with disproportionate ratio of observation in each class. That's it, the number of samples per class is not equally distributed. As shown here with this histogram from the Amazon dataset review, where the number of five-star reviews almost equals the total of the other four type of stars reviews combined. Some other examples of class, data, uh, class imbalance data sets are traditionally the fraud detection data sets. For example, in a credit card, credit card fraud detection data set, most of the credit card transactions are probably not fraud, and the very few classes or the few few samples are fraud transactions. This leaves us with something like 50 to 1 ratio between the fraud and the non-fraud classes. Other examples of class imbalance data set could, you know, uh, come across in anomaly detection or medical diagnosis, in particular with rare disease medical diagnosis. Now, the problem with the class imbalance data set is that the machine learning model may not work well for the rare classes, 
as there are not enough samples to learn patterns from, so they will be hard for the classifier to identify or match those patterns. Some ways to deal with class imbalance problems, apart from, say, changing the performance metric for the particular machine learning problem, from maybe accuracy to precision, recall, or F1 score. So the other ways to address class imbalance are basically related to either balancing the data set or the way the machine learning algorithm learns or explores the data set. Such as a downsampling the dominant class, this is as intuitive as it sounds, involves randomly removing observations from this dominant class to match the size of the rare class, while upsampling the rare class is the process of randomly duplicating observations from the rare or the small class to match the number of the dominant class. Now, data generations, or, or also known as creating synthetic samples, or data augmentation, is a close cousin of the upsampling. For example, resampling for the rare, from the rare class, with, while slightly perturbing features, values, thereby creating basically new samples. Whereas the sample weight, uh, the next tactic here is to basically have the machine learning algorithm pay more attention to rare classes by increasing or assigning higher weights to those rare classes and lowering the weights on the dominant classes. As most machine learning algorithms don't handle missing values, you might want to become familiar with, some, with a few techniques to deal with missing data. One way to deal with missing data will be to drop rows and columns with missing values from your tablet data set. Depending on how many missing values are in the data set and how are being distributed across rows and columns, removing those rows or removing those columns from the data set might lead to less training data samples and or less features to build your model upon. And that in turn can lead to overfitting or underfitting models. So maybe it's a better idea to figure out some techniques to fill in the missing values, and this is called imputation. One option is to do average imputation on missing numerical values, for example, which is replacing the average missing values with the average value per that numerical feature. The common point imputation for missing categorical values is replacing the, mo uh, the missing values in that categorical features with the most common value for that particular feature or column. There's also a placeholder imputation that you can do, which assigns a common value for missing data location. It could be either numerical or string, depending on the type of the features. There are also some advanced imputation techniques out there, which can, you can use to predict numeric uh, missing values for complete samples using machine learning techniques. For example, the AWS Data Week uses neural networks to predict tabular data missing values. Most of these imputations can be completed with a simple imputer transformer from Scikit-Learn, as shown here. Right? That you can choose from strategy mean or median on the numerical data sets, uh, numerical features, or you can uh, use uh, the strategy of more frequent or constant on both the numerical and the categorical features. Let's see how exploratory data analysis works in practice using NumPy, Pandas, and Matplot libraries in Python Jupyter Notebook on our review data set. Let's read our review data set in and analyze it, and this will also be good practice for the final project. Let's open the Jupyter Notebook for a walkthrough.